Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commodity Culture, where we break down the commodity space for both new and experienced investors. My name is Jesse Day, and before we get started, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And today's guest is an author, former Wall Street financial analyst, the founder of DollarCollapse.com, which he sold a few years ago before transitioning to Substack at Rubino.substack.com. It's John Rubino. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Jesse. Good to meet you. Well, as you are a new guest, we have to start with the origin story. So take us back. How did you first discover investing? How did that lead you to sound money in the precious metal space and to becoming a financial analyst and author? Well, my, uh, I, I'm so old that my origin story starts in the 1970s. I was uh, a freshman in college and was thinking I was going to be a, a philosophy major. So I picked up a philosophy book called How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World um, by somebody named Harry Brown. And uh, I liked that book, so I looked at his other stuff. And it turns out that he was also a gold bug investment advisor. And he had a book called You Can Profit from the Coming Monetary Crisis. And this being the 1970s, we got a um, giant monetary crisis in the second half of the decade. Inflation spiked and oil prices went through the roof and we had all kinds of geo geopolitical stuff going on and gold and silver just um, soared. So I was plugged into the idea at that time from reading uh, Harry Brown's book. And so I watched it. I didn't participate in it, but I watched it and was very impressed with how much money you can make if you catch a big move at just the right time and with um, how fragile financial systems in the modern world are. So, so I went out and got an MBA and, and uh, spent 10 years working for mutual funds on Wall Street. And then I started writing about this stuff and, and have been doing it ever since. I've done a million magazine articles and um, written or co-written five books. And then, as you said, ran a gloom and doom financial website for a lot of years. Uh, and what, what's, really interesting about, from my point of view, what's interesting about my story is that we've come full circle. You know, we've created the conditions for another financial crisis um, on a much bigger scale than the 1970s, but with the same general outline. You know, we're uh, inflating away the big fiat currencies and interest rates are becoming volatile and energy prices are becoming volatile. And all that's left now is for inflation to really spike and gold and silver to go through the roof to completely um, recapitulate my formative experience. So, and, and, you know, I think there's a good chance that that happens in the coming five or so years. Well, let's start with the state of the economy at present. A recession always seems to be just around the corner, but hasn't fully materialized in the way that many expected. And now the media is awash with bullish stories about a soft landing. How do you see things unfolding? You mentioned the 70s and the financial crisis of those times. Do you see any parallels to where we are today? Oh, huge number of parallels, uh, only on a much bigger scale. We, we were actually in financially pretty good shape back in the 1970s, so we could fix spiking inflation with much higher interest rates. We can't do that this, this time around because interest rates are so high, or, or um, I'm sorry, debt is so high that if you try to raise interest rate, you, interest rates to um, 1970s level, which were double digit, close to 20% in some cases, uh, you bankrupt so much of the economy that you would go instantly into a 1930s style depression. So, so we don't have the tools to fix things this time around. Now, you know, about the, um, the immediate economy, there are a lot of cross currents. The, uh, on the downside, there are dozens, it seems, uh, of indicators that are all screaming recession is imminent, like, you know, the uh, inverted yield curve to take just one of many. That usually um, presages some kind of a big downturn. And we've got the most inverted yield curve ever right now. So that's that says a recession is coming. Um, and on the consumer spending side, that's I, I think where the story is really intense right now, because um, We've, um, you know, Americans saved a lot of money during the pandemic and we've been spending it ever since in order to maintain our lifestyles. And we basically have run out of excess savings. That, that money's gone and people are putting um, their day to day lives on credit cards now, which means a growing number of Americans are, are carrying debt that charges them 20 or 25 percent a year, which is a recipe for 
disaster. And this is happening while um, student loan payments are kicking back in in October. So you've got all these people who are, who already can't make ends meet and are having to borrow at huge interest rates just to survive, who now have to pay on their, their student loans all of a sudden here. So I, I think that the consumer spending side of the economy is, uh, is heading for a, a big drop, which always and everywhere causes a recession. Uh, now at the same time, um, real estate is a mess as well. 7% mortgages have basically frozen the housing market and the commercial real estate market is, uh, is tanking. Office buildings are just, they're, they're changing hands at half of the, uh, the previous price and, uh, and all that debt that was taken on in the previous 10 years at really low rates on office buildings and apartment complexes and malls. That, that debt has to be rolled over, but at much higher rates, which uh, is going to lead to a bloodbath and, um, commercial real estate, which is going to lead to a bloodbath in the banking sector because banks and um, insurance companies and pension funds own so much of that real estate debt. Okay, so that's that's the uh, recession is imminent side of the story. Now, the other side of the story is that wages are starting to spike. Um, unions are figuring out that they suddenly have bargaining power and they're striking or threatening to strike and they're getting big uh, wage increases. Uh, United and, and American Airlines both gave their pilots 10% raises per year over the next four years. So 40 some percent increase in, uh, in wages. And uh, UPS, as, as you probably heard about, um, is going forward now going to pay a lot of their drivers 170 grand a year. You know, that's, uh, that's tremendous money for um, delivering stuff. Uh, and you can spread that across the rest of the economy. The UAW, the United, United Auto Workers Union, is uh, threatening to strike. And uh, whether they go on strike or not, they're going to end up with a, a you know, a, a big money wage increase going forward and probably a much sweeter pension plan. So those things have two effects on the economy. One is that the people making all this extra money can spend it, which is positive for growth. And the other is that it spooks the Fed because the Fed sees wage inflation as real inflation. They don't, they don't think rising prices for stocks, bonds and real estate are inflation at all. They ignore that. But when people start making more money, the Fed gets scared. And so they're liable to keep interest rates higher for longer, which will also um, probably guarantee a recession going forward. So it, probably what's going to happen is that interest rates will continue to rise until something serious breaks and we'll get the recession, we'll get the equities bear market, and then we'll get the Fed capitulation. You know, all, the, all of that is gonna happen according to the standard script. And then the, um, the question is, is it fixable this time with the standard tools of lower interest rates and, um, and tighter or easier money and bailouts everywhere you look. And I, you know, I think that that's, that's open to debate. It could be that we just can't fix things now because easy money will give us higher inflation um, and tighter money will give us a depression. And those are the only two tools we have. So uh, I, I think the coming few years is gonna be a departure from the past few decades in a bad way. And uh, there's no way to know how it plays out. There's no way to know the timing. Uh, but I think things get very, very dark in the not too distant future. And where does this leave the U.S. dollar, this scenario that you've described for us? Because, you know, th there's been a trend towards de-dollarization in terms of, you know, everybody thought that the BRICS nations were going to, or a lot of people, a lot of gold bugs, I should say, thought that there was going to be a gold-backed currency announced at the recent BRICS summit. Um, and that's kind of the dream of every gold bug that the de-dollarization is coming and we're going to see gold return once again as sound money. But of course, the dollar is extraordinarily dominant for international trade. So I was just wondering, you know, as the founder of dollarcollapse.com, do you see the US dollar eventually collapsing and what could replace it? Is it a new gold standard? Is it just... Um, foreign currencies, people settling for trade in their own currencies, as we've seen with some of the BRICS nations. Well, what's your view there? Well, the, the, the dollar story is very interesting going forward because there are two really um, contending forces. Right now, um, 
clearly we're inflating the dollar away because we're we're borrowing money parabolically now. If you look at the uh, the chart of the the government's debt in the U.S., it's going straight up from here. Um, that's usually the end game for a fiat currency. So we're going to keep on borrowing insane amounts of money, keep on creating enough new currency to cover that new debt. Um, and that's going to cause the value, the purchasing power of the dollar to go down until it becomes disorderly, at which point you get that 1970s on steroids currency crisis. At the same time, though, the, as you said, the dollar remains the world's reserve currency. And every time there's trouble in the world, money flows into the U.S. because the rest of the world seems even shakier than the U.S. does, no matter what's going on here. So um, as the global financial system gets more and more unstable, um, capital could flow into U.S. dollar denominated accounts, um, making the dollar hold up better against the euro and the yen. So in other words, the dollar will be, quote unquote, strong if you look at it versus other currencies, but it'll be very weak when you look at its purchasing power. So it depends on who's talking to you about the dollar, about whether it's a strong currency or a weak currency. But ultimately, <coughs> excuse me, ultimately, it's going to be inflated away. It's going to collapse. And we're going to have to have that monetary reset that Jim Rickards has been talking about for a while somewhere out there. And it's possible that it's not really that far away. And it's also possible that it's very far away. But I, th I think uh, the sooner rather than later school has the stronger case right now. In other words, that... Um, that things get unstable pretty quickly and the Fed has to try to bail everybody out. And that's the decision point where we find out if it's possible to bail everybody out with easy money or if that spikes inflation and blows up the world's fiat currencies right away. Uh, so, in other words, really exciting times from the point of view of a finance nerd, right? Or living through financial history. Uh, and it won't be fun for most people, but it'll be fascinating for the, the people who've been paying attention all these years. I completely agree with you. I am fascinated watching all of this unfold. So does this mean we will eventually return to a gold standard? You mentioned the situation of the Fed being unable to remedy the situation and fiat currencies blowing up. So in that scenario, will nations be forced to return to some sort of gold-backed currency? Well, the current system is broken. It's It's in its death spiral right now. And when it completely collapses, we'll have to replace it with something. So that's that's the important thing to understand here. It's not clear what we're going to replace it with, but I would say that um, a gold standard is known territory. We've done it. We did it for 200 years. We had a global gold standard. Uh, so we know how it works, how the mechanism works and uh, and how people are supposed to behave within that kind of a system. So that would be the simplest alternative. And uh, there, there are other possibilities where we, we bring the IMF into it and make them the world's central bank and um, um, their currency, which is SDR, special drawing rights, becomes the global currency. That, that doesn't make sense to me because SDRs are basically just a currency based on a basket of other currencies. And if those other currencies collapse, then the SDR is worthless. So, and, and we could try a crypto related thing. Maybe, you know, Bitcoin becomes the, uh, the global reserve currency. I also think that has a lot of problems because it's uncharted territory. So we have no idea how to actually do that. And, uh, you know, you don't play games with the global financial system. You, uh, when it's not working, that's such a crisis that you go with what's safe. So yeah, we could go back to something like a gold standard. And um, I think it would be a great idea. I think it would work. But I, I think it only happens when it's the least bad option among a lot of really bad options for the world's governments. Because to go back to a gold standard means giving up the power to create money out of thin air. And no central bank, no bureaucrat, no would-be dictator will give that power up lightly, you know, unless the the alternative is uh, is uh, a French Revolution style kind of thing where the aristocrats get beheaded again. So I, I think we'll reach that point where um, a gold standard, as horrible as it sounds to the guys in charge right now, um, looks like the best choice on a very bad list of choices. And uh, you know, again, timing, impossible to say, but I, I definitely think that a gold standard, 
a gold-backed currency globally, will be something that is debated going forward and will be very possibly put into practice at some point. I've been asking a number of guests this question on the show recently and been getting a variety of responses. So it's fascinating to hear the different perspectives. So I want to put this question to you. Could the situation the economy is in right now in both America and globally be an engineered collapse? In other words, is the Fed and other central banks with their current policies, are they ignorant? Are they helpless? Or are they just plain evil? And could we be witnessing a manufactured collapse of economies to consolidate government control, potentially push a central bank digital currency? Well, that is the big question, really. Are they morons or are they evil geniuses? Because there's evidence for both. You can, in, in their behavior, you can see signs that they have no idea what they're doing and signs that they're pursuing a long-term plan that ends with us, the 99%, as the debt slaves of an aristocracy. I'm, I'm not sure which of those is scarier, but uh, it, it kind of has to be one or the other, right? So um, let, let's examine, I mean, the, they're, that they're morons is easy to understand, basically. But the, um, the evil geniuses um, trying to enslave the rest of us plan, and that's a, um, a scenario that you know, in a lot of ways, they're telegraphing. I mean, if you just listen to the guys of the World Economic Forum, they say it, you know, they say um, what, what they're intending to do. They, they intend to have global surveillance where you give up your um, old fashioned ideas of privacy, um, central bank digital currencies that are completely programmable, which means you're at the mercy of the political system in which you live in. In other words, if you, if you join a protest movement against a, a never ending war or whatever, uh, they can empty your bank account to keep you quiet. You know, that's that's the kind of world that they are basically discussing in public forums right now. So I, I think it's completely possible that that's the plan. And I, I think that explains a lot of the behavior that's out there. But I don't have any inside information. You know, it could be that they're just idiots who have no idea what they're doing and they're just they're playing the hand they're dealt in any given week, month, year, and it's leading us off a financial cliff. So I don't know. And uh, the fact that it's beyond our control, in other words, there's nothing you and I can do politically that changes the institutional momentum of the world's governments. We're blowing up our currencies and that's just all there is to it. Um, so this it becomes kind of like a religious idea where you know you can debate it but you can't really know the ultimate answers to the big questions and maybe you're left with um, managing your own life as best you can in other words investing to take advantage of a gigantic financial crisis as the um, the thing that you can do both to get yourself and your family through it and to keep you sane while you're doing it you know because if you uh, if you envision making life-changing money as the global financial system falls apart, then it's an, actually an optimistic um, investment thesis. And, and you can wake up each day uh, with a little bit of motivation instead of just curling up in a ball. Like if you just focus on the world as it uh, appears to be, in other words, a, um, a global system that is broken and is falling apart, and may end up being taken over by dictators who really don't care about you. Um, that's, that's no way to live your life. So it's, uh, it's psychologically a lot healthier <laughs> to, to focus on tending your own garden, basically, and, uh, and becoming as self-sufficient as possible and investing to exploit the next big financial crisis. So, uh, you know, that, that's the way I approach things to, uh, to offset the fact that I really don't know the answer to whether they're crazy or evil or both. And there's nothing I can do about it in any event. Well, very nuanced answer. And that makes a ton of sense. So why don't we pivot in that direction in ways that people can protect both their personal sovereignty, their individual freedom, and their wealth, and potentially take advantage of this otherwise dystopian scenario. So um Let's start on the actual protecting freedom and sovereignty side of things. How do you see that? What's the best way for people to do that? Is it potentially like 
a, a little bit of uh, my story here and viewers who, who watch all the time are probably sick of hearing this, but I left my home country of Canada in October 2021 once Justin Trudeau was reelected to relocate to the Balkans. I'm currently in Serbia um, and there's just much more value placed on individual freedom, civil liberties, family values, uh, these sorts of things. And nobody in this region of the world trusts their government. So I personally want to be surrounded by people who don't trust the government so that if something does go down, people are immediately going to suspect the government of malfeasance as opposed to jumping in line and doing whatever they're told as has occurred in Canada. So is relocating geographically or, or trying to have the ability to be able to live in different political jurisdictions? Um, is it, you know, growing your own food and kind of staying off the grid? What, what's your view there? Well, the, the relocation thing is, uh, you know, it's very tricky. It sounds like you, you've done it right because um, the way you describe the Serbians, they're, they're ahead of us in the process of becoming cynical. And, you know, the number of people in Canada and the U.S. who still trust our governments is astounding. You know, how can you still trust the government after everything they've, um, they've done, after the, the uh, you know, looking us in the eye and lying to us about so many things for such a long time? Um, and I think it's going to be really chaotic getting from here to um, Serbia level cynicism, which is where we'll need to be at some point. So, yeah, I think um, relocating has some advantages, but it's a very complicated thing. And, and uh, it's an individualistic thing. You know, every situation is different. So I don't, I don't have a lot of advice to give on that topic. But uh, on the rest of it. I think we're, we do well to just basically adopt the prepper attitude and lifestyle. It turns out those guys were right all along. And um, we should be doing everything we can going forward to become as self-sufficient as possible. Like that, That's why um, go out and try to buy a homestead property right now. And you'll find out that it's uh, there aren't that many of them because they get snapped up right away as soon as they come on the market. Because lots of people have that idea. Um, but to the extent that you can, you know, become partially food self-sufficient by growing your own food, totally do that and, uh, and invest to, um, to make yourself as um, invulnerable as possible to variations and fluctuations and collapses in the fiat currency system. In other words, don't be dependent on your bank account that's full of dollars or don't stuff a bunch of dollars under your mattress. Don't own a bunch of government bond funds or um, bank stocks because those things depend on the value of the dollar. And I'm talking about Canadian dollar as well as the US dollar um, for their value. Uh, instead, invest in real things that governments can't make more of on an electronic printing press, farmland, energy assets, uh, obviously gold and silver, you know, become a gold bug and a stacker and uh, just steadily add to your stacks over time. Uh, and you'll be insulating yourself financially from the worst of what's coming. And, uh, you know, if you want to be in the stock market, the... Um, the companies that own things like energy assets and um, precious metals and mine them will tend to do really well too. You know, they, they will tend to go up in a gold and silver bull market more than gold and silver or oil or uranium or whatever go up themselves. So they're, they're kind of leveraged plays on the things that should do best in a financial crisis. So there's a lot you can do. And, you know, on, on, on my Substack, that's what I focus on is actionable um, advice along these lines, like what exactly kind of oil companies do you want to own? And, you know, how do you judge a uranium stock? And of course, gold and silver miners, you know, which gold and silver miners do you want to invest in? Um, and those are things we can all do um, to give ourselves a good shot at, at not just coming through this in good shape, but uh, actually making a lot of money along the way. Then, <laughs> at the same time, and maybe the most important thing you can do is embed yourself in your community because nobody gets through something like this alone. You know, the, the cabin in the woods thing, that's a very specialized strategy. Most people live in communities and um, the best way to be in a community always and everywhere, but more so now than maybe ever before, is to be a part of, commu of your community where you've got neighbors who have your back. 
and you have their backs. And together, you're a much stronger unit than you would be if it was just you and maybe a couple of family members. So start paying attention to uh, who lives around you, how you can make friends with them, how you can help them on the assumption that when the time comes, they'll help you and pay special attention to your most heavily armed neighbors. <laughs> they're, the, they're the guys you really want on your side when the time comes. Very well said. And I love that approach. Community, obviously very important, having the right people around you with the right mindset. Um, and when it comes to the investing side of things, obviously this is a show all about commodities and I'm very excited to discuss uranium with you in just a moment. But first, I'd like to get your thoughts on silver because I spoke to David Morgan recently on the program and he thinks that in a recession and broad market crash, as we've been discussing, although gold recovers fastest in that scenario, silver would ultimately rise higher on a percentage basis coming out of such a crash. Do you concur with that? Yeah, I think the, the big risk with precious metals is that, um, you know, we could tip into a recession, we could have an equities bear market and that could pull everything else down. And that, that happened in um, 2008 and in 2020, where equities tanked and gold and silver tanked too. But in both cases, you know, the Fed responded with easy money and gold and silver bounced off those V bottoms and, and took off to, in gold's case, a new record high both times. Um, so that's probably the scenario that we'll see again. You know, we'll see the uh, the crash, um, Fed capitulation, and then uh, gold and silver to the moon. So you don't want to jump in with both feet today because of that risk of um, of losing forty percent or fifty percent of your money before you make three hundred percent. But you probably should because we really can't time any of this. We don't know exactly what's going to happen in the next six months. So you should approach gold and silver investing on a dollar cost averaging basis. In other words, put the same amount of money each month into precious metals. And then when they're down, you end up buying more ounces. When they're up, you buy fewer ounces and your average price ends up being nice and favorable. Silver is, is much more volatile than gold. So in bad times, it falls harder. In good times, it goes up more aggressively. And, you know, so the silver story is just great right now because it's an industrial metal where the, um, the demand for it is growing, especially in solar panels. There's a new generation of solar panels coming along that are more efficient and generally more attractive to people setting up solar farms and rooftop solar. And uh, those new generation of solar panels use more silver. So the demand in the solar industry for silver, which is already pretty high relative to the amount of silver that's out there, is going to rise. And that's going to soak up all the extra silver that's out there. So you get just a, you know, a little bit, a little bump in investment demand um, to go with the rising industrial demand. And, and silver is a very um, thinly traded market. It's small and uh, a little bit of extra money makes a big difference at the margin. So you could see um, silver really spike when investment demand starts to pick up. And that could happen if, if gold goes up. Like you said, gold tends to go up first, but it pulls silver along eventually. So, you know, a scenario where gold goes to $5,000 an ounce and the gold to silver ratio goes from today's 70 or so to down to 30, which means gold goes up twice or silver goes up twice as fast as gold. You get um, silver above 100 bucks an ounce. And, and that's a not a hard thing to envision in what's coming. So that's the kind of thing you could see with silver. And so, so silver quadruples from here and the um, best quality silver mining stocks um, become 10 baggers. And that is life changing money if you're positioned ahead of time. So that's a very easy to envision scenario playing out. And the downside risk at this point, after we get through the V bottom crash scenario, uh, the downside risk is very minimal because we're going to have um, the central banks of the world going back to easing again. And that's always great for precious metals. And silver be, will be wildly undervalued in that kind of an environment. So your your downside risk will be minimal and your upside potential will be outrageous over, a, say, a two or three year stretch when things really get going for silver. Well, let's dive into uranium, my favorite commodity. Um, 
why are you bullish on uranium and how do you approach the sector? Obviously, there's only a couple of big publicly traded producers. Um, do you invest there? Do you look to the development space, that sweet spot between um, you know, uh, development and production? Do you speculate on explorers? Do you stick to the ETFs? What's your strategy in that sector? Well, the, the overall uranium story is really interesting. And, and basically, it's that um, after Fukushima and after a lot of green parties gained power in European countries, um, a lot of countries basically just gave up on, on um, nuclear power. And they mothballed their existing plants and they closed down the, the ones that were on the drawing board and everything. So the demand for uranium um, went down and the price went down. But it turned out that the windmills and solar panels and natural gas pipelines that these countries were going to replace their new plants with didn't work out nearly as well as planned for various reasons. You know, solar and, and wind just aren't generating the electricity they were supposed to. And uh, natural gas pipelines, you know, the U.S. blew up the biggest natural gas pipeline in order to spite Russia. So all of a sudden, Germany is in big trouble because that was where it was going to get the um, energy that it was going to use to replace its nu nuclear plants. And, and so the world is starting to uh, realize it made a mistake. And a lot of countries are going back to nuclear. They're, uh, they're bringing their existing plants out of mothball and they're, uh, um, they're contracting for a lot of new plants. And China in particular is just building dozens of new nuclear plants. So all of a sudden, the demand for uranium to fuel these plants is, um, is looking very positive. And it's going to grow from here because, you know, if you build a nuclear power plant, um, you're not price sensitive after that. You basically have to um, feed that plant no matter what you're paying for the uranium to do it, because otherwise you're shutting down something that costs you $8 billion or whatever, and you're not going to do that. So the, um, the demand for uranium is growing and it's not price elastic. You know, the price is not really going to determine demand going forward. Uh, and that's a really nice place to be, which means that um, the demand for uranium already exceeds the supply that's coming out of today's mines. And it will exceed what's coming out of today's mind, mines by a really dramatic number in the not too distant future. So the price has to go up in order to incent a lot of new production. And that means if you've got um, a working uranium mine today, it becomes a lot more valuable. So having said all that, great story, you know, lots of money is going to be pouring into the sector. How do you invest in it? And there, as you said, there aren't really that many big, easy to identify uranium mines out there. There's one in uh, Kazakhstan um, and there's um, Cameco, which is sort of the Exxon of the, um, the uranium market. And then there's a lot of other um, uranium miners that are in various stages of um, developing their mines and turning their mines into producing assets. Um, and, um, you know, the best of that bunch has been doing really well lately. So they're probably reasonable things to invest in, even though they're not producers yet. So you have that risk of the, the transition from uh, um, developing mine to a producing mine is, uh, is risky. You know, there, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So they're not risk free. Whereas Cameco is, uh, is the closest thing to risk free in this market. So you, you can buy the, the biggest um, exploration and development companies. You can certainly buy Cameco. Um, and you can also buy, there's a really interesting thing in this market, um, the, the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. Now, physical commodities trusts are a, re a really interesting concept because they're kind of um, perpetual motion machines. You know, they borrow money or they, they issue stock and they go out and buy a commodity and then they store it. So they take it off the market which makes the price of the commodity go up, which makes the uh, commodities they've stored go up, which allows them to sell more stock, to buy more commodities, take them off the market, as, you know, in, in general, um, going forward. And that tends to other things being equal, um, push up the value of the commodity and push up the value of the, uh, the stock price of the commodities 
of a physical commodities ETF. And so the, uh, the Sprott version of that in the uranium space is really interesting. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, all the, the physical commodity ETFs are interesting because they, they have them in gold and silver as well. But the uranium one is especially interesting. And it, it just announced that it was going to get to give you an example of, of how they're different from regular stocks. It announced that it was going to sell a lot of its own stock. In other words, raise money via an equity offering, which normally um, makes a stock go down. Right. If you're going to dilute the value of the existing shares, then shareholders will tend to be less enthusiastic and your price drops on the announcement of the financing. Uh, but the uh, the Sprott Fiscal Uranium Trust um, its stock went up when it announced it was going to sell more stock because everybody realized that that was going to lead them. They were going to take that money and buy uranium with it, take it off the market and raise the price of uranium. So that's actually a good thing for the uh, the, the ETF. So um, that's that's why it's so interesting, because it, it can almost do no wrong <laughs> in this kind of a market. So, yeah, there are a few things you can buy in the uranium space. It's not anything like gold and silver, though, where there's a hundred possible stocks of various configurations. You know, there, there, there's a fraction of that in the uranium space, but the ones that are there are, are basically pretty good. You know, the, the highest quality ones are, are of pretty high quality. Uh, and uranium is such a great story that most of the, um, the big names in the uranium market now will work out really well because they've got the wind at their back of an ever higher commodity price. So yeah, I really like uranium and I own a lot of those stocks. So I, I, I'm kind of talking my book here to an extent, but I, I own the stocks because I think it's a great story that really has legs over the next couple of decades. Absolutely. Well, you're preaching to the choir here, my friend. Um, you did touch on energy earlier, so I'd love to get your thoughts there on the oil and gas space. You know, we're seeing a lot of over-the-top ESG mandates, this whole push for renewable energy. Um, so you're seeing media headlines as well proclaiming that the oil space is dead. However, there's been years of underinvestment in the space. Oil is needed as much as it ever has been, if not more than ever. So how do you currently see the energy space positioned? Is this an area that you're deploying capital now? Is this a space you're watching in the case of a recession? Um, do you think the price of oil and energy equities would fall in the case of a recession? I'll put that question to you as well. Oh, yeah, they would definitely fall if there's a recession because uh, they're, they're cyclical in the sense that if uh, if you lose your job, you don't drive to work. So you use less gas. So oil demand goes down. Um, but again, just like gold and silver, you know, they'll they'll rocket out of their V bottom if there if there is an equities crash and a recession that that takes down um, oil and gas as well. So that's the risk. But the um, the longer term market story is good for oil and gas right now. Part of it is that, uh, like you said, they've been beaten down, they've underinvested. Um, and the ESG thing is now a dying concept. It turned out to be just stupid on so many levels that uh, I, I think that three or four years from now, you're not even going to hear that acronym anymore. It's just going to be um, discredited and it's going to fade away. Um, leaving their, you know, leaving a, a kind of sort of shortage in the oil market. Um, right now, demand seems to be exceeding supply, which is why the oil price is up so much lately and why Saudi Arabia and Russia and the rest of OPEC can get away with production cuts that don't cost them very much because they can, they can cut production, the price of oil goes up and they make just as much as they would have if they didn't raise prices and kept producing or didn't raise, uh, or if they didn't um, cut production and they kept on producing more. So, um, and um, electric cars, which were going to replace internal combustion engines in the next three years or four years, um, they, they've got issues of their own. One of which is that um, the things that go into the batteries, um, we don't have enough of them yet to completely replace all the existing cars with electric cars. So somewhere we've got to find the, uh, the stuff that goes into those batteries. And it's not a it's not a lock. It's not a done deal that we're going to find all of those things. And it could be that the prices have to go up enough 
that make that they make batteries more expensive, that may, they make electric cars more expensive, so the thing doesn't work as well as it should. You know, that that's the kind of story that um, that we have to work through with electric cars. So we're gonna, still going to drive gas powered cars um, into the indefinite future, and there will still be demand for oil because of that. So the same thing with natural gas. It's a, um, a really good power source and um, electric stoves and gas heat. Those those are nice things. I don't think we're going to eliminate them, although, we're, you know, in the U.S. we're talking about it. That's not going to happen. So the demand for gas will continue to be pretty solid, although there's an awful lot of gas. So the supply uh, supply demand balance is harder to predict with natural gas. But with oil, I think there's a decent chance that the um, the price of oil stays high, um, at least at levels that generate lots of free cash flow for the best run oil companies, which means their dividend plays, uh, which is a nice thing to have in this kind of world. They can be kind of defensive because they pay you to wait for the $150 oil that, uh, that people are talking about, you know, cause at today's prices, they'll still pay you a 4% dividend or whatever. So I, I, yes, I like oil companies. I like gas companies. I, I think they'll be okay going forward. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, John, a ton of knowledge shared greatly appreciate it. Before I do let you go, for those who want to hear more from you, could you tell us about your Substack and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online? Yeah, my Substack is at rubino.substack.com. And, and basically, I, I cover what we're talking about here, along with a lot of other things like um, privacy. You know, I have a, a um, series called How to Be Invisible. And uh, it's about protecting yourself from all the surveillance that is out there. But um, also which uranium stocks you want to buy, which oil stocks and which junior gold and silver miners. And uh, um, so it's aimed at actionable ideas that might work in this world. Great. Well, I'll put a link in the description to the Substack for anybody who wants to check that out. Thank you once again for joining us today, John, and sharing your knowledge with the audience. Thanks, Jesse. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.